Welcome back to Worst Seats in the House. Mike Russo, Anthony LaPanta coming to you uh, first show in May. And we're uh, about to wrap up round one of the playoffs. Go on to round two. Uh, I came into town for literally um, 19 hours. It's supposed to be a little longer, but I had a six hour flight delay out of Raleigh um, just to do laundry repack. And now I'm heading tonight to Florida to cover the second round of the playoffs. We don't know the opponent yet. Uh, by the time this podcast comes out, we will know if it's Boston or Toronto. Um, selfishly, I will say I am kind of rooting for Boston tonight, Anthony, just because it will make the travel so much easier. One, there's a ton of nonstops between Florida and Boston. And second, I don't have to hear clear customs if it's in Toronto. So, And it is really all about your travel schedule. It is. That's, that's all what, that matters. That's what should be first and foremost on people's minds. I thought it was interesting when Florida wrapped up their series and I heard a couple of their guys interviewed afterward. Mm -hmm. And the first at that time, Boston, I think, was up three to one. And a couple of the guys said when asked about the rivalry with Tampa and they said, well, it's fine because now we're moving on to face probably our next biggest rival anyway yeah, in that Boston. Was that was my question, actually. That, uh, that I'm sure it was that a great answer. question. It was. It was. Uh, it was. It, and, it, you know, it was he basically said there's no way we're going to have an emotional letdown. The other reason why they're there probably won't be an emotional letdown as it's been a week since Florida played. I mean, it, it's been so long since Florida played. I don't even remember being there. And I had covered, uh, I covered four games in five nights in three different cities, three closeout games in three nights. Um, kind of felt like one of these broadcasters bouncing around from game to game. I don't know how they do it. I was by the third game in Raleigh. I was like a zombie that day. Um, I, you know, just every day, just imagine like, you know, and we talk about, you being a local uh, broadcaster all the time and how you know the wild, like the back of your hand We're national broadcasters. If you're listening, you pretty much know, all right, they are, they don't know a lot about the teams. They know the, uh, they're probably the elementary amount. They try to do their best, but just imagine if you're doing one game, then game, again, game, game, and right. you're traveling, it's hard to prep. It's because you got to sleep at some point. Well, you do. And in fairness to these, the national broadcasters, cause I get asked about it a lot. The fans that say we hate when these guys are doing the game and, I've always, and I get asked sometimes, would you ever want to do that instead? And I always say, no. I mean, this is the one time a year I'd rather be a national guy and be calling Stanley Cup playoff right. games. But all season, I would rather be with one team. The fact that it's my hometown team is an added bonus. But number one, you have a home base. You're with the team. You're connected to the team. You're, you have relationships with the coaches, with the players, all that kind of thing. Because I listen to those guys when they come in to do a game, and I listen to the questions they ask in the morning, and sometimes you just think that is really the depth of knowledge that you're bringing to the table for tonight's game. And in fairness to them, it's because they might have been somewhere else two nights ago doing two totally different teams. They might see the Wild three times all season, and you realistically, you number one, don't have the, the bank of knowledge, but you also don't have the trust and respect of that coach where you can find out what's really going on. And we have these one-offs with the coach of the wild every day when it's the playoffs. Sometimes those overlap with the national broadcasters. And it's amazing how much less our coach is willing to say in that meeting than he is when it's just Ryan Carter, Wes Walls and I, Joe O'Donnell having the chat where he'll tell us what's really happening. A lot of it we don't repeat on the air, but we at least know what to stay away from because if we think, well, we've kind of liked this guy's game, but the coach says we've hated this, 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 or we're mm -hmm. changing this or adjusting this, it's just something we can watch for. But when those guys would come in, and we saw it a lot last year in the playoffs because we had crews that had were doing games, I think we were overlapping with the Colorado series every other night, where a lot of times those guys had flown in they missed morning skate, would show up to do the game with absolutely nothing other than the game notes <laughs> to go on. Yeah. And that's, that isn't easy, but it also then, when I'd listen to some of these shows, I'd think, okay, well, I heard him talk about that with the wild. It certainly brings in a little bit of a, a little bit of doubt about if you're hearing what they're talking about with the other team, mm -hmm. can you assume that it's true <laughs> accurate like i'm not going to repeat it unless i right. confirm it just because okay well that little thing you just threw out about that that's not yeah. right and it's I, I don't mean this to be critical of them it's just a reality their yeah, job is different yeah than mine. yeah and and 
But I do remember the last year in the playoffs, I remember Dean Evison being very close to the vest because at one point there was one crew there where he knew the color guy was buddies with Pete DeBoer. And so he didn't want to say right. like, yeah, Mark Andre Fleury starting game two. And then all of a sudden he runs to DeBoer. Hey, by the way, Mark. Andre. Well, and the, yeah. I will say this, that we actually went to the wild at that time because we had the first meeting with Dean for the playoffs and he, well, they welcomed all the national guys in. So we went to the very first meeting. There were a couple of questions that we knew not to even ask because we knew he wouldn't answer them in front of them. And we went to the wild and said, these are not of any value to us. We might as well just sit in the press conference room with all the writers and everybody else, because he's not going to mm-hmm. say anything in front of us as long as the national guys are there that he won't say in front of all the writers. Right. And Dean through our wild guys, apparently they just said he only wants to do one of these broadcaster meetings. So for us, they really were worthless throughout that entire Dallas series, <laughs> just because every one of them included the national guys and whatever the reason is, whether it's a personal connection, just a lack of trust, which is reasonable, the coach isn't going to say anything in those meetings. Mm-hmm. And that's why they're so valuable to us when, and it's funny sometimes, because sometimes we're on the road. The only people excluded from it might be you and John Shipley. Mm-hmm. We all go, we, we talk to the coach in the hallway, and then we go around the corner and chat with them with the broadcasters. And in many of those cases, the only other two people there are maybe you, Sarah McClellan, and John Shipley. Right. But it, most of the people are in both meetings. Yeah. And it sometimes feels a little strange, but there are some times where the information is valuable, where it might be yeah. a game time decision. And we just need your best guess yeah. because I've got to print my stuff, get our stuff ready. We can't be blindsided by this. We can't find out at 630 that this guy's not playing. Yeah. Our pregame show starts at 630. You mm-hmm. guys hit the ice at 632. And if we start the show with, hey, Jake Middleton's been on a roll and all of a sudden he doesn't hit the ice for warmups, we look silly. So that's those are the kind of things that we'll sometimes get in those meetings that they just don't want to be public. We don't publicize it until we go on the air. But it is strange sometimes when you really think about the fact that there's eight of us in the first meeting and six of us are going to the sec- the <laughs> second meeting. I I just again like like my my point too though from a like I'm just amazed the way they go in the playoffs you know from city to city to city and when do they sleep when do they get uh, time to prep all that stuff now the one thing I will say is after a game they're going back to the hotel to get some rest where I'm leaving the arena at one a.m. and then on the same flight as them but a good example actually is like Jody Shelley I mean this guy has been bouncing around game to game to game and a lot of them he and I overlapped and I'm like. I said to him in Raleigh the other day, I'm like, how are you doing? Because I feel like crap. He goes, I feel great. You know, like, well, the, like it was the only exciting. Thing, right. The only thing I would say is that from a broadcaster standpoint, once you've, once you've reached this point in the season, the stories are telling themselves. Yeah, yeah. It isn't a ton of research. There's not a guy you haven't heard of on the third and fourth line. There's not some new guy wearing number 73 that you've never heard of before. Mm-hmm. There isn't going to be a last minute roster move or anything else in most cases. Most of the time, your research can be done out of the game notes because, look, for example, let's say Boston's playing Toronto and you're calling game six. Well, you've been following what's happened in the first five games of the series. You, you certainly have to go back and do some research to make sure you're up on the details, who scored the winner in game four, those kind of things. But so much of what you're going to talk about is dictated by what's already happened in the series. The first or second game might be a little different where you really have to brush up on the whole season, who was hot, who was not at the end, who has been injured, all those kind of things. Once you get going into the series, I'd say 90% of your prep is what's happened already in the series. And so it isn't quite the same as dropping in to do a Wednesday night game between the Wild and the Hurricanes in February when you maybe haven't seen either one of these teams play in a month. Yeah. The playoffs are a little different, a little easier. And for an analyst like Jody Shelley, who I think is one of the more underrated local analysts in the league, I think he really does a good job. He's the Columbus uh, color guy. Right. And I've always felt like he was one of the better local guys. And I listened to a ton of local broadcasts during the year. But I think for a color guy, so much of it is if you go back and you even are zooming through the previous games, 
so much of what you're going to talk about is reacting to what happens in this game right. anyway. Some knowledge of what's happened earlier in the series certainly helps, but you could get away with it if you hadn't seen a minute of the series. Yeah, yeah. The play-by-play -play guy's a little different because he's got to be on top of it. He's got to... No numbers. Right, and he yeah. has to have the the ability to drop things in quickly and the yeah. flow of a game doesn't have the time to wait for a whistle. Here's a funny story is, so we're in, uh, I'm in Washington the other day and I run into Kenny Albert and I'm like, Hey, how are you? I, I saw you on long Island yesterday. Where's Brian Boucher? He goes, well, you're not going to believe this. So they did game three of the Rangers capital series. Then they went and did the Islanders Carolina game. They both, because they were coming back to do game four, uh, of the of the Capitals Rangers series, they they just literally took their suits to uh, that they were going to wear that night to New York and left their bags in their hotel rooms, their respective hotel rooms in Washington. All of a sudden, second period of the game on Long Island, Brian Boucher is between the benches. He gets a text from TNT. He goes, "Hey, we got Edzo, somebody else, and somebody else in Vegas. They're having trouble the, tomorrow getting to Denver because of a potential snowstorm there." The change of plans, you're now going from New York to Denver. And he is on the air, like texting him. He's like, uh, problem. All my bags and clothes and toiletries are in Washington. Didn't matter. Gets on a flight the next day, flies to Denver. Okay. Kenny Albert now goes back to Washington. Brian Boucher gives him his hotel room key. Now, Brian, he's going to go into Brian Boucher's room, pack up his bag and overnight it to him. Because uh, essentially he had no nothing but the shirt on his back, literally uh, in Denver, and it's like there's a weird story. So any uh, actually, I mean, the one thing I will say, I told my editors these some of these stories, and he thinks it's so fascinating. One story I'm actually working on now is where I'm talking to a different broadcaster about what it's like to travel during the playoffs and at some point in the third or fourth rounds. I'll be trying. And we always <laughs> joke about the fact that <clears throat> we have it so much easier than you do traveling with a team. Yeah, the best time well there's a lot we're spoiled by the way we travel with a team and that's the other advantage of being with one team is i just fly with them i don't take care of one flight reservation hotel reservation anything and we never set foot in an airport unless we're coming from canada into the u.s and have to go through customs but i i think out of all of them the moments that i appreciate it the most are when a game is over and we are wheels up four hours after face-off to the next city, whether it be home or wherever we're going next. I always prefer to fly that night. Oh, yeah. Get in at, even if we get into our hotel room at 2 a.m., you get in, you go to sleep, and you're now you're there, as opposed to having to catch an early morning flight yeah. to catch up with the team. And I, I will tell you this, so I, this, Certainly doesn't compare to what you're talking about with these national guys, but the last wild road trip of the year, we, we went to Chicago to start after a game at home mm -hmm. against Winnipeg, if I remember right. Play, I know we played at home on a Saturday, yeah, yeah. flew to Chicago after the game, played in Chicago, then flew to Denver. I had a stretch where it was a 10-day trip. A little bit of it was taken on myself because I the team went to Denver at a national TV game, I could have gone home in the middle had I wanted to, but I just wanted to stay with the team. And in order to do that, because of the fact that I didn't want to make the team pay for a hotel room for me, I stayed with my son, AJ, for two nights. But I wound up, those two nights in Denver were the only two nights that I slept in the same bed consecutive nights in a 10-day span. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how I feel days. now. Yeah. I mean, I had nine, yep. I stayed in it was 10 days. The only time yeah. I stayed in the same bed back to back were those two. And one of those was the night I arrived yeah. in Denver and just basically yeah. went to his house and crashed. Yeah. Well, that's how I am now. So I flew what last Wednesday to Washington, but I stayed by the practice ramp because I had to go do an Ovechkin story, checked out of my hotel, went to downtown Washington. Now I did stay there for the, for a couple nights cause I cover, covered games three and four, but then I flew down to Florida stayed at a Sheridan suites down there. Then I flew to Raleigh, stayed at a Spring Hill suites, but then because Raleigh won and the other series ended, they had me stay in Raleigh a couple extra days. So I changed hotels and now I flew back here for one night. Now I'm going back to Florida tonight. So, um, but you know, what's funny. So you were talking about like commercial versus things. So I'm in, I fly to, I'm flying Florida to Raleigh the other day through Atlanta. We, we were late leaving Florida we land. I didn't realize how short my connection is. We land in Atlanta and now I, 
I was leaving from gate A31. We're trying to park at gate A15. Somebody's in our gate at A15. So they parked my plane in back of A31 for like, honestly, a half hour. I'm staring at my connection, knowing that I am, might miss this connection. Staring at outside my window seat at the plane that I need to be on right that moment. They had already done boarding. We finally park. I run down A31. I'm the last one on the plane before they close the door, knowing that my bag's not arriving because there's no way it's getting there. And then, of course, then I, I land in Raleigh, no bag. I have to go back to the airport. And I got a game in like four hours after landing. It was, it was a, a nightmare um, scenario. But that was a, that's a game where it's like I, I get to the arena and I'm going through the game notes and I felt like I was cramming for a test. I'm like, I, uh, like, I know I'm writing about Carolina and Islanders tonight and I have not watched one of their games really because I've been bounced around and it felt, I felt like one of those. But don't you feel like when you get in, like, I'm not, I haven't done one of these games yep. and yet I feel like if I got a call tomorrow to say, Hey, we yeah. need you to go do right. game six of this series. No, no doubt I've about that. I've been following right. all the series but to, enough. to write an article and right. try to pretend like, you know what, what's going on and make sure that it's, right. but that's you what know. I'm saying is like, you've been following this yep. enough where you could drop in there and by the time the game was over you number one a lot of what you're going to write happens in that night's game anyway yeah. but number two you're going to have a couple of hours to okay this guy's having a good night well what has he done the rest of the right. series and i think that i don't want to say fake it but you're for sure going to be able to get by because of the fact right. that both you and i are wired the same way I've been sitting at home throughout these playoffs. I've been working Twins games throughout these playoffs. I've always got whoever's playing in the playoffs on my iPad on the side of the desk. You're watching every series. You're still following it because that's just what people that are wired like you and I do. Yeah. No, uh, there, like there are certain things that are, some are easier than others. Like, you know, like I, I wrote Jake Gensel's story uh, that was in today's athletic. I, I flew home from Raleigh yesterday, hour and what, 50 minute flight. I wrote it on the plane. You know, like there's some that are easier than others, but then there's others that you just like, man, I got to, I'm really writing about this guy. I got to know who the, like tomorrow I'm sitting down with Carter, but for Hagee, I know that he's the most clutch player I think I've ever seen in the playoffs, right. but I still don't know much about Carter for Hagee. Like I no, need to prep, but on, it isn't like know? a live interview yeah. either where no. you don't yeah, have yeah. to, exactly. You can ask the questions no. and find out about him as you go. Exactly. Clearly want to have the a, background. Yep. You clearly somewhat to the point I was just making you know his story because you've just watched yeah. games and you know that he scored this goal in this series and this goal in mm -hmm. this series. That can all be researched relatively quickly. And by the time you sit down and are done talking with him, you'll have learned something about him and that will dictate where your story mm -hmm. goes. You don't have to sit down. It isn't like you're sitting down on television. I've got 20 minutes with yep. this guy and I better have my ducks in a row yep. before I start because yeah. it's on TV. People yeah. are going to see it. And Instead. And I pretty much have an idea who Carter is. Like, I remember at the NHL media tour in Stockholm last year, as like I had, I was the only U.S., I was the only North American writer there. So I had uh, 15 minute interviews with every single player that was there exclusively. But as some guys were walking in, I was just like, okay, I mean, I know who Yarn Croc is, but I really don't know. So I'm like Googling the most, like, like I, I remember Felix Lindstrom, I think his name is the, like, the or Sandstrom Felix, whatever the like the third or fourth goalie is of the Philadelphia Flyers was coming in to talk to me. Like at one point, I was like almost said to the uh guy from the NHL, I'm like, you know, I don't really need Felix. But anyway, all of a sudden Felix is walking in as I'm literally just Googling who the hell he was. And that was a tough interview. Like I'm pretending that I know who he was. Uh let's do this. Let's hear about some of our um awesome sponsors here as we're coming from the Aquarius Home Services studio. Anthony, but when we come back, I want to talk to you about um, your objectivity, uh, your uh, ability to be a journalist. I object. Um, your object. Uh, I want to talk to you about Bally's because a lot of people are asking about that. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the wild on the show, but there has not been any news from the wild in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we'll talk about some of these playoff series as well. But uh, tell us about Feller's Ranch. I'm so excited to have Feller's Ranch as a part of this show. And part of it is just because I believe in their product and I'm thrilled that we're a little more free to talk about it. I think I've mentioned them on earlier shows before they were a part of things here, but it's a locally owned cattle ranch in Southern Minnesota. These are local farmers that have committed themselves to creating the best steaks in the state, and they've done it. It's unbelievable, the marbling that you'll find in these steaks. 
I recommend them to people anytime. There's a couple local restaurants where you can get them. And I say, it might not be on the menu. Just ask them what they have from Feller's. But now if you go to fellersranch.com, they'll deliver it right to your house. I think their truck is in town a couple days a week. And even if it's another deal, they'll figure out a way to get it to you. You won't be disappointed by the cuts of meat. They won't even release their steaks unless they're at a marbling level that is so far beyond what USDA Prime mandates as a minimum. Check them out. Go to fellersranch.com. Try the ribeyes. If you can get your hands on the Denver cuts, try those. The fillets have been terrific. I literally have not been disappointed with any of the steaks I've gotten. Check it out, fellersranch.com. Hey everyone, attorney Jerry Bosch here with Bosch Law Firm and WorkCompExperts.com. For almost 30 years, we've represented Minnesotans just like you all over the great state of Minnesota to guarantee they've been treated fairly and with respect when they've suffered a work-related injury. A work injury can change your life in an instant. You need someone on your side who can help you focus on getting back on your feet and getting paid while you do. You may be entitled to medical benefits, wage loss benefits, job placement, retraining, and payment for permanent disability. To make sure you are being paid all the work comp benefits you're entitled to, please call the attorneys at Bosch Law Firm. The call is always free, and there's never a fee unless we recover benefits on your behalf. Call 651-333-8300, Bosch Law Firm, or visit us at workcompexperts.com. Hey, this is Russo for Livia Way Control Centers. Now is the time to get a jump on summer the Livia Way. Join Livia today and get your first eight weeks free. In those first eight weeks, by following Livia's nutrition plan and with the help of their expert team of registered dietitians and nutritionists, you can lose up to 20 pounds or more. Imagine how much better you'll feel, not to mention how much better your summer clothes will fit. Join Livia today and you'll also receive a complimentary in-body scan. Take it from me, I joined at Christmas and I've lost more than 40 pounds. I've been on the road for two weeks covering the playoffs. I have six more weeks on the road and things are going perfectly. I travel with my food. I do weekly check-ins with their dietitians. And anytime I need anything, I just know that they're a phone call away. I'm well on my way to my weight loss goal. So join Livia today and get your first eight weeks of Livia's nutrition plan free. Visit Livia.com. That's L-I-V-E-A.com or call 855-GO-LIVIA. Make sure to let them know that Russo sent you and they'll get you all set up. Plus, Livia's medical weight loss is now offering GLP-1 medication starting at just $299 per month. Quiet the food noise and see accelerated results by summer. Visit Livia.com or call 855-GO-LIVIA. Get a jump on summer the Livia way. Back here, worst seats in the house, Michael Russo, Anthony LaPanta, uh, uh, part-time broadcaster, part-time journalist. You are you only want to be a journalist when it's convenient, apparently. And, uh, and man, people went after you this week for, uh, for you know, apparently you have to be a journalist to know when a Dallas star is diving. And some guy, that it all started because some guy said, you call yourself a journalist. Like, and I, never I said, I've good. never once called myself a journalist ever, nor will I ever. I'm glad I'm not. And then the second was, I think I poked some fun at him for saying that I take objection to something and I, I don't take objection, objection to it. He was talking about objectivity was what he was trying to say, but it, it prompted a couple responses. And another guy had, I think said it's so you're so clearly biased. And I was like, biased, it's a Dallas Vegas game to whom do you think I'm biased? Neither one of these, I have no connection to either one of these teams. And you don't have to be a journalist to know that Dallas dives more than any team in the NHL. It also doesn't mean that. You also that- don't have to be a Dallas Stars fan to admit that. They are, it's embarrassing the way that they dive. And it's got to be just taught there because they all do it. They all do it. They all they do it. They did it in the playoff series last year. It wasn't why they and beat the bad Wild. At it, man. And yet these refs, like Mason Marchment is. Anytime he hits the ice, it's a dive. Anytime. And, I, and it's and it's the worst acting ever. It is. And one of the guys for whom I have a ton of respect in this league is Jamie Benn. And I think you know that. We've yes. talked about him enough. And he ditto. Had, he had an embarrassing dive in the playoff series last year against Minnesota that was it was and ludicrous. The ref bit. And the ref bit and called the penalty. And it doesn't mean that, number one, that because Dallas Stars players dive – that that means that I think the Minnesota Wild are better than the Dallas Stars. I don't. <laughs> I have a ton of respect for this Dallas team. It's the team that I picked to win the West when the playoffs started. I still believe they'll win the West if they get by Vegas in the first round. They're the deepest team. I have so much respect for their draft team, scouts, and player development crew 
they have hit on some picks that I think have them set for years to come. I believe it's going to be a handful for Minnesota to beat that team for the next five, six years with the way the rosters are currently built. And it that led to a few interactions with some fans. And I take exception to when people, and to say take exception might be an exaggeration, but it makes me wonder when people make comments, like there were a couple like, oh, now that Jack Edwards is retired, you're the biggest homer in the league. Ah. What I would say is, Go listen to any other local broadcast. Listen to them. Listen to five games at any point and come back with any, and I'll say U.S. local broadcast because the Canadian situation is a little different. They have so many national games with so many different sets of announcers that it's, it's a totally different landscape. But if you go find an American-based broadcast team that is more down the middle than ours, I'd be surprised. and. We Every local broadcaster would prefer their team win more often than they lose. And it isn't because you're a homer. It's because your games are more exciting when, they're, when they matter at the end of the season. You, the team's more fun to be around. You cover the Minnesota Wild. You would prefer that their games matter as opposed to cover a 20 and 60 team. But your living doesn't depend on them winning. You have no impact on whether they win or lose games, just as I don't. I go to the rink every night hoping it's four to three in overtime. And I really don't care which side wins. I just want an exciting game. I would prefer the Wild win enough of those games to be relevant at the end of the season. But I think sometimes people mistake that we look at a broadcast and I don't know what the number is. 95% of our viewers are Wild fans. They are watching the game through the eyes of a Wild fan. They're excited when they win. They're frustrated when they lose. They're disappointed when calls go against them. So to some degree, you're catering to that fan base. It's just like when you write an article. 95% of the people that read that article are Wild fans. Mm -hmm. So you going in depth on the life story of Mason Marchment might not be very interesting to a Wild fan after a game, even if Mason Marchment was the best player on the ice that night. Funny you brought that up because I actually would love to do a it's And it's somewhat similar for us where a lot of the content that we'll put together in a broadcast is either wild related, whatever Minnesota connections there might be on the other team, whether it be Minnesota natives, guys who played college hockey in the state, guys who used to play for the wild connections to the wild organization, all those kind of things, because we find those are the most interesting to wild fans. But if I think the wild got a break on a call that, went their way, we're going to say it. If I think they were on the wrong end of a bad call, we're going to say that too and be objective about it. For me, I think it's easier because most of what I say, I keep to be factual. And I don't feel I'm qualified to say this power play was lousy. I can say the power play is two for their last 26. That's a factual statement. Now I can let Ryan Carter or Wes Walls explain why they think the power play has struggled. If they think there's a player that is, that is at fault. Mm -hmm. I them under the bus. Well, no, but (laughs) they're more qualified. Yeah. Yeah. They played in the NHL. They can say, I can throw out that this guy's lost eight out of 10 faceoffs tonight. It's a factual statement. Are you really going to argue with me about it? If he's one, eight of 10, I'm going to say that. Does that make me a Homer? No, I'm pointing out a statistic that I find interesting at that moment in that game. And yes, we get more excited on a, for example, on a goal call when the Wild score, and that is because 95% of our viewers are Wild fans. It's just they're ra- yeah. they're raising their hands in celebration on their couch. Mm-hmm. They're not when Dallas scores. It doesn't mean that I'm biased toward the Wild. I'm trying to put a broadcast out there that is that entertains, informs maybe gives a little background information that makes the viewing experience more entertaining. And that's about it. But it, I I just always think people go listen to some other local broadcasts. In fact, Mm -hmm. listen to the other local broadcasts in our market. And I love the job Corey Provis has been doing with our twins broadcasts. Listen to him. He gets a lot more excited when a twin hits a home run than a visiting guy. Does that make Corey Provis a, a faulted Homer? No, he knows that he's speaking to twins fans. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think, I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know. It's definitely the advent of social media, but like the, another team's fan base 
And this is this I guarantee is the same with wild fans. They always they look at the other team's writer and they look at the other team's broadcasters and almost use them as a target to to like show fandom for their team. And I don't know where that started. Like, like, I mean, I had Vegas fans and Winnipeg fans coming after me like, you know, when the wild were done at the end of the year, like your season's over. No, no my season's not over. You know what? Your season's over because you're not actually going to go into the buildings where I'm leaving tomorrow and going to Washington and I'm going to Florida and Carol. My season has definitely not ended. My life livelihood does not depend on the wild. Would I rather be here covering wild playoff games right now? A hundred percent. But, but I don't work for the wild. I don't, I mean, I really honestly, deep down, if they win or lose, that is not a thing that's me. But for some bizarre reason, when the wild play, the Dallas stars or the wild play, anyway, it's just like the fans there, Google, who are the sports writers that cover the Minnesota wild and then just go after them. Like they, like they are employed by the team. And that at some point has absolutely changed it. This is not just unique to you or unique to me. This is wild fans picking on a guy that covers the Canucks or the ducks or, I mean, this is every, all the time. It's right. bizarre. And that's what I've always, people ask me often why I coach. I coach because that's the one spot where I do have an impact on the outcome of the game. And I feel badly when I can get on the bus, if my high school football team lost their game, when I get on the bus after a wild game, I had nothing to do with whether they won or lost. I'm not depressed when they lose. I'm not giddy when they win. I, I have nothing to do with it. I have zero control over the outcome of the game. And you know this as well because we've sat around dining room tables in arenas before games. My A little bit of my livelihood depends on it only because I get paid by the game. So if the Wild <laughs> make it into the playoffs, I get a few more game checks. If not, I switch to Twins duty earlier than I would otherwise like. And I'm like you. That That's now my livelihood is now I'm a Twins baseball guy. My season doesn't end when the wild ends. I would love to have seven playoff games every year because all we get is the first round anyway. But aside from that, I don't know why it is that. And when you listen to the shows and as soon as you say something like, Hey, I think, you know, what's funny is I'll make a statement on a replay. There's a, let's say it's a goalie interference challenge and I'll look at it and say, I don't think this is going to go the wild's way. I think it's a whatever, whichever way the challenge is going. I think they're going to overturn this goal because I do think Marcus Foligno made contact with him. Without a doubt, I'll get people that'll, how dare you say you think the call is going to go against the wild? What are you rooting for the other team? And I'm like, do you think what I say has anything to do with the officials in their review right now? I'm telling you what I think. What I think is Marcus Foligno collided with the goalie and the goal is going to get overturned. And it's that simple. I might be right. I might be wrong. It's my opinion. And I will add this to it, that for all the people who always will then say, listen, you are employed by the team. I'm not employed by the team. And in 12 years of doing games, I have not one time had a conversation with anybody from the Minnesota Wild that has said either, we want you to say this, we don't want you to say mm -hmm. this. Not one time. One time they questioned a tweet of a picture that I took of the dog taking a dump on the ice and said, we'd rather you not draw attention to this. <laughs> and I, and I actually understood that immediately when it was done, it was a mistake. I shouldn't have done it just because of what the repercussions and the automatic replies were going to yeah, be. Yeah, and yeah, they yeah. were. Yeah. Yeah. But I have not one time have I gotten a call from somebody with the wild saying, you know what? We don't want you to say that ever again. We don't want you pointing this out. We don't. If the Wild hated me and thought I was doing a lousy job, they'd probably have the ability to go to Bally's and say, we don't want this guy in the air anymore. But I don't work for them. They understand that I don't work for them. And I just try to keep it down the middle, factual. And yes, sometimes you have to state your opinion on things. But that doesn't mean that I'm an apologist for the Wild. That's the other thing I'll always get. Stop making excuses. Making excuses. I just pointed out the fact that tonight, this guy, this guy, and this guy are out of the lineup. <laughs> that that's it. That that's a fact. Those guys are not playing. I'm not saying, hey, the Wild have no chance tonight. They shouldn't. The league shouldn't have even made them play this game without this guy and this guy. I just said those guys are out. That's not an excuse. I'm not the coach. Yeah. I'm not the GM. I'm not the owner. I agree with you. Um, 
this brings us to a segue about uh, whether or not one day you might be working for the wild. Um, you know, obviously Bally's again is in the news. They've been in going through bankruptcy hearings forever. It seems like it's been a couple of years of turbulence over there. Um, but now we are getting to the nitty gritty. They have, I think a May 15th court date where they are going to have to show both the court and the league how they're handling this Comcast situation. Comcast is, as Wild fans and Twins fans know, have pulled out right now, and you can't see it if you're a Comcast subscriber. 30%, I believe, of Minnesotans uh, get Comcast, which um, is something that obviously is going to be a major problem for the Wild if if Bally is, is not on Comcast come the new year. I think like all teams right now, there's one year left on the rights deal. I believe the Wild get between 20 and $30 million in that rights deal. Um, they're like all teams are looking at potential alternative options like uh, over the air or streaming. Um, there's no way, even with that, if they have a subscriber streaming, that they're ever going to get back uh, what they would lose in the rights deal. But this seems to be now a point where it's getting very, very concerning that the Wild are going to be on Bally's next year. Well, for sure, it's concerning. And I don't know any of the details. I, I don't know any of the details on what exactly the rights fees are. I do know there's a year left on the deal. I don't know anything about the negotiations with Comcast other than to say these are normal. These happen every time carriage deals come up. It just happened. I have DirecTV at my house. It happened this winter where their deal with NBC came up. And for about two weeks, I didn't get any of the NBC channels on my DirecTV. I lost Sunday Night Football. I lost all the NBC programming. Then they figured it out and made a deal. It's happened with what was then Fox Sports North and DirecTV a few years ago. I don't know how different this is. I think part of what makes this more concerning and problematic is that there is the added wrinkle of bankruptcy. And it's been an unknown after an unknown for the last two, two and a half years for all of us that are employed by Valley Sports North and the other Valley Sports Regionals. We've already seen a few of them that have disappeared. I hope they get something resolved. I think it's, I think it's better for the teams if Valley Sports North remains a viable option for them to have one channel that provides the Twins, the Wild, the Wolves, the Lynx, Minnesota United, all of those things, rather than all these teams having to do it on their own. It's a sure bet for all the teams because they get a rights fee check as opposed to taking on the risk on their own. But the reality is it has to be a viable business. And in order to be a viable business, you have to have carriage on the major providers in town. So I hope they get a deal done. I don't know any of the details. I get stopped about it all the time. And some people that are criticizing Comcast, some that are criticizing Bally's. And every time I just, I said, do you think I'm involved in the meetings? <laughs> I show up and do the games. And as of now, we continue to show up and do the games. And I just, I hope they get it resolved. I think it's in the best interest of everybody involved if they can somehow make this work. But if it doesn't, then... Each of the teams in the market are going to be on their own to try to figure out a way to get their games distributed to fans. And no matter how the video world has changed, streaming, binge watching, how anybody gets their television, what channels they watch, which services to which they subscribe, the one thing that has never changed is people want to watch sporting events live. Mm -hmm. They want to some, they don't want to sit down and watch. It's not like a Netflix series where they're going to binge watch 10 shows in two days. You want to watch it live. Somehow they will find a way to do that. Somehow those games have to be put on the air. And I just hope that it remains as close to the current model, because I think it's what's best for everybody. Well, also from a production standpoint, I mean, the one thing about Bally is if you're watching a game, you know, these are professionals in the truck. Uh, I mean, the games look awesome. They sound awesome. Um, it is going to be an unbelievably expensive proposition if the if the Wild have to start producing oh, these games. I mean, it, it's tens and, of thousands well, of dollars per game. For, it is, and it's more, a lot more than that. But it's but the truth is there are some overlapping costs that are right now shared by all of the teams for whom Bally's owns the rights: the Wolves, the Wild, and the Twins. We've got a studio. We built a studio, spent millions on it that is available to all three teams. If the teams now take on the rights themselves, what are they all going to build a studio? You know, the infrastructure of your production team is, is the same. Now each of these teams has to have guys. And I don't know how many of this would be, but 
they're going to have to have people that right now, let's say we have 10 or 12 people that are involved in all aspects, whether it be technical sales, production, crewing, to the actual hands-on relationships with the team and all, that now each one of these teams is going to have to have their own person to do that. And where we have it, a crew of people that do it for all three or four teams for whom we own the rights. So, and then you've got some talent that overlap for sure. I mean, you look at, I I'm involved with wild and twins. Katie storms involved with the wolves and the twins. Audra Martin's involved with the wild and the twins. And there's some overlap with all of those people into other teams. Marty Gellner gets involved in all of them. And, and what are you going to do now? Does each one of the teams have to find their version of these people? That It isn't as easy as some people might make it sound where they just say, I'm going to just, I can't wait till they leave Bally's because I'll just get this. Well, I don't know exactly how it's going to work. It's a complex thing. And I, I just hope the sides come together and get away and figure out a way to make it work. Yeah, I agree with you. When we come back from this, uh, this uh, uh, um, break, I wanted to talk to you about the playoffs. But then we have a bunch of Twitter questions. We haven't gotten to the wild yet because not much is going on. But uh, obviously, uh, a lot of questions for us. We'll be right back. There are a lot of options to buy glasses out there. If you've been disappointed by high prices or poor online quality, check out our friends at Huxley Optical. I like Huxley for two reasons. First is the price. Simply put, I don't want to spend $800 on glasses. At Huxley, I know I'll get the same quality for half the price. They're a small, independent business that is here to help you find glasses you love and save you money. Second is the service. They have options catered to what I need, and I know someone will be happy to help me find glasses. Whether it's a lens replacement, office glasses, or a brand new pair, they're always ready to help. Check out HuxleyEyewear.com. Again, that's HuxleyEyewear.com today. Or go to their locations in YZ or Roseville. Tell them Russo sent you for 10% off your prescription purchase. Hey there, it's Russo representing my friends at Aquarius Home Services. With summer closing in, the last thing I want is to be left in the heat. That's why I reached out to Aquarius Home Services. In no time, they dispatched a skilled technician to perform my AC tune-up just what I needed. Professional, knowledgeable, and efficient, the technician prepped my furnace for the upcoming summer heat. One thing I can tell you is Aquarius delivers a five-star furnace tune-up experience. A comprehensive evaluation of your entire heating system, results shared, and any questions answered with a smile. And here's the best part. Right now, you could save 50% off on this essential service. Aquarius ensures transparency with upfront pricing and even offers their no-breakdown guarantee. Don't gamble with the summer heat waves. Get your AC in top shape with Aquarius Home Services today. Aquarius believes in earning the right to be recommended. They're just a click away at AquariusHomeServices.com. Don't wait. Save smarter with a 5.10% annual percentage yield 13-month certificate from Royal Credit Union. Royal's 5.10% 13-month certificate has no minimum opening balance and a locked-in rate for a guaranteed return on your investment. Open a 5.10% 13-month certificate at any Royal office or online at rcu.org slash certificate 510. Early withdrawal penalties could reduce earnings and principal. APY accurate as a 3-1-24. Insured by NCUA. Back here, worst seats in the house, Michael Russo, Anthony LaPanta. Uh, we'll be having uh, three more shows this month. Uh, no live shows, though, just because of my travel schedule. And Anthony, uh, obviously, doing twins. But we got a ton of shows coming up the rest of the summer as well. And we have a playoff consultant who is yeah, chomping exactly. at the bit to join us on the next show. That's Vinny LaPanta, who was a part of a show earlier, impressed us so much with his organization. Not only that, and- but we got a lot of, like, people on Twitter who say nothing as we've talked about ever nice to us uh, that were loved when Vinny and, and his buddy Ron. Right. So Vinny is going to join us. I think on the next show, he, he texted me when he thought this show was going to be done from with you at a remote location. And when I said, no, we're going to do it in person in the kitchen, he was disappointed. So he said next week, he said, I've got a packet of stuff on each playoff yeah. series. And we should mention we've got we had made our picks for the playoffs. There are, as we record this, six series that are complete. So far, I'm six for six. You were five for six. One remaining that we differed on, where you had Toronto and I had Boston. By the time people hear this show, they'll know the outcome of that series. But as we record, Game Seven is tonight. I thought it was interesting that the five series that ended the fastest were the five on which we agreed. Yeah, and I really felt going in, I thought that. I thought there were six series that I had very little doubt who would win. The only two that I really went back and forth on were Boston, Toronto, and Vegas, Dallas. And those two are 
here in game seven. Right. I picked Toronto. You picked Boston in that series. We both picked Dallas. Um, and uh, Vinny, just so we give him some credibility, yeah. he also has Dallas and Boston and has hit the first six. So he's it. it this is our playoff consultant. He's going to come in. I, I don't know what he's got in store, but he'll be with us next week. Yep. Uh, we're both, uh, even though we uh, we both picked Dallas, we're both rooting for Vegas because as we discussed early in the show, we hate Dallas. Um, well, I'm just, no, yeah. I am I have no objection to yeah, Dallas. Exactly. A um, couple of things I wanted to talk to you about um, just from series that I've been at. One, uh, Rangers, they are, they are good. They didn't have to play great at all against Washington. Man, did Ovi not look good, but. I, I mean, I was Ranger, surprised how little he played. Yeah, like the last game, he was he was so good for them like in the second half minutes. of the season. Yeah, and and I, I voted Spencer Carberry was, was one of my three picks in the Jack Adams voting. I know he wasn't one of the three finalists, but I thought the job he did getting that team to the playoffs mm -hmm. was remarkable. When you consider that they did nothing except hurt their current roster with moves during the season, and yet all of a sudden. He had those guys playing a great style. Charlie Lindgren was a big part of it, but he had them so locked into their system the second half of the season yeah. that I thought they were as overachieving a bunch as any to get in. Rangers and are very good. I think they the Rangers are, are the best team yeah. in the East. Yeah. See, and I think Florida is. I, I am, I'm assuming we're going to see Florida and New York in the next in the next round, but Carolina is is really good. Yeah, New York's going to have their hands full with yeah, Carolina. Absolutely, and and actually, I'm shocked, but they are uh, at least Vegas odds. They're a big time dog. Like I think it was sixty forty. Uh, the Rangers, started, yeah, the Rangers were a dog yeah. to start the well, series. I against. Wish I was in Vegas. I yeah, throw some money on that. Yeah, but. like, uh, but I guess five on five, all the analysts say that Carolina is the better well, team. Carolina, they really rely on the power play. Carolina uh, has been analytically the best mm -hmm. team in the NHL for about five years. Yeah. They just haven't been able to finish. And Jake Gensel was supposed to be that missing piece. He certainly has been great. He's been a great addition for them. I love their defensive core. I love their possession style. But I just think the Rangers have that it factor right mm -hmm. now. Their decor is something. Igor Shosturkin in a big game. I know he wasn't as over good Freddy. this year as yeah. he has been in previous years. I'll take him over Freddie in a big mm -hmm. game. Can I just tell you one thing real quick? Yes. Um, so I, I sat down with Freddie in uh, Carolina to do a story about what he went through this year. What a good dude. Like, you know, I've always, every time I've ever watched him on interviews, he's very quiet and things like that. And, and, he, but he is so like, when you sit down with him, he is so bright, is so well-spoken, soft-spoken, but well-spoken. I had a very, I, I enjoyed getting to know him. I had a really similar experience. The first time I ever talked with him was when the wild were in Toronto a few years back. And the reason I went to catch up with him was because I had recently talked to Bruce about having Freddie in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. And I had asked Bruce before we went on the road trip about him. And he told me some good stories about how quickly he loved Freddie, how quickly he thought Freddie was their goalie of the future. So I sat down with Freddie Anderson and I had a chance to just chat with him when the rest of the media departed in their locker room. Mm -hmm. And I brought up playing for Bruce and we started the conversation that way. I think I talked to him for 15 minutes and this was on a game day and it was after all the, you know what yeah. it's like with the Toronto media there. Yeah. You don't get 15 minutes with anybody, Yeah, but they had all left. And a, a few of them afterward were like, what the hell did you talk to Freddie? Fred, did Freddie get 15 words in? And uh -huh. like, he was great. And I really had a ton of respect for him after that, about just the way that he approached the game to how appreciative he was for the opportunities that Bruce gave him earlier in his career mm -hmm. and how well-spoken he was about that. I, I walked away from my first interaction with him the exact same way you did. Yeah. I, uh, um, I'm kind of upset that I don't get to do the Carolina, uh, uh, Rangers next series because being around Carolina and their PR department, they're just so good and so accommodating to me. Not that I'll tell you one thing, Florida is too. Like, it's crazy. Like, uh, Addie you who have runs a picture on the wall. There. Yeah. Well, Addie, who runs her department, it's like anytime I ever need anything. Did they she, bring you ice for your space bar thumb injury? Uh, no, that was uh, that happened in Washington. Uh, and obviously I was right, being, I was, sure I was being well hyperbolic, but my God, is that the worst commercial ever? The two of them singing, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what's the stupid song? They, the, what commercial are you the, talking the, about? Uh, what are you in? Uh, I don't even, I'll find it. It's annoying. I will tell you that la I watched, I sat here last night and I watched almost two full hockey games start to finish, which 
as much as I've been following hockey, a lot of times I'll have it on in the background with music playing while I prepare dinner. Last night I got done with dinner. I sat down and watched the last two periods of the Nashville Vancouver game. And then all three of the Vegas Dallas game. And, Oh, I did see this, but I've only seen it a couple of times it's on every minute. Right? Well, there were two commercials that I grew oh, sick muted. of. Mute it. There oh. were two commercials that I grew sick of so fast last night. One was the woman from the the show that was in Taormina, the hotel show. Oh, uh, um, uh, a lo- white lotus. White lotus. Uh-huh. The the oh, blonde yeah, yeah, woman yeah, yeah, that's yeah. in that. That yeah, yeah. when the commercial ends with yeah. her being asked if she's a robot and yeah, says, Stifler's "How would mom. I?" How would I know if I was a robot or something? Yeah, How would yeah. I convince you? Jennifer I'm not? Coolidge, right? So that commercial is on every single commercial break on the Turner shows, and there's one other one that came on. I don't recall which one what it was, but there were those two. I said every commercial break, these two commercials are on. Mm-hmm. I, that Capital One, I had only seen a couple times. Oh, but. it's it's uh, brutal. Um, all right, let's just really quickly uh, before we get to the wild talk about Florida. Um. I have such a new appreciation for Sasha Barkov. I mean, He's this guy player. is, he makes everybody around him better. He is so good. It's, n- he just, he gets better with age. Like there are times it's like for years, all right, yeah, I'm tired of everybody saying he's most underrated, most underrated, most underrated. When you watch him up front, he is a freaking battler. He's such a good dude too, to talk to. I, I got to talk to him at the NHL media tour in Stockholm last year. Um, and then I go into their locker room the other day and he comes right up to me and remembered me from covering the Stanley Cup finals. And then the, uh, the, uh, the NHL media tour, like just a really sharp dude. I always think there are guys that you gain an appreciation of the way they play when you watch them every night for an extended Mm -hmm. period of time. And when you just watch them a couple times here and there, you don't get a full appreciation for everything that they bring. And we talked about it a little bit this year with the Wild. Where Can I, I think- say something that might piss you off? He's everything that the Wild wished Miko Koivu was. He is. I, like well, he, what I was just about to say yeah. is he's Jewel Eriksson Eck yeah. with a little bit more skill to yeah. finish. I think he's that player mm-hmm. because he plays that way every night. And now I haven't watched him seven games from start to finish in a series, but there are a couple players that have really popped up. One we talked about a few times with the wild this year on a much lower scale. Zach Bogosian was that guy. Like I didn't realize we've got Stanley and Phil here on patrol. Apparently, Sorry. Yeah. Per- apparently the other team's most dangerous player just walked down the street. So yeah, exactly. Stanley and Phil have got him under control. So anyway, the Barkov, I agree with you with that. The, the couple guys that really stood out to me that I've watched that way. One is Roman Yossi. Mm-hmm. I thought Roman Yossi was the best defenseman in the NHL in the second half this season. He was the reason Nashville went on that unbelievable run, and I watched a fair amount of that series with Vancouver. That guy's unbelievable. Yeah, he's. I always appreciated his offensive ability, his skating ability, but his size and strength yeah. is it's unbelievable. And the way that Nashville was able to play – was largely because of how well he was playing and yeah. how well Saros was playing. Those two guys were special. Brunette said that uh, that in the second half, Roman Yossi is the best he's ever seen on it. Like, I, the, I agree. Coach. That was exactly the point I was making. Yeah. I think we talked about it when you mm-hmm. were asking me about Norris candidates. And to me, it's Yossi was by far the best this year. Yeah. I know Makar, well, he might even win Quinn it, Hughes. but he's going to get a lot of votes. And Quinn Hughes. But watch that series. Mm-hmm. Quinn Hughes was not at Roman Yossi's level. Right. Um, you know who was unbelievable in the series is Brock Besser. Like, I'm just so happy good. for this guy. I mean, the way that in that in there, but he big, plays a different role. Yeah, he, no, no. I'm just I'm just as a segue. Right. Like, he is. He was so good for them. Um, and and then gets the hat trick in the game where they just had the miracle comeback that turned that entire series around in their benefit. Um, you know, it's just for a guy that last year they were trying to trade. For a guy that last year, frankly, if the Wild could have afforded him, would be a Minnesota Wild right now. For him to have the type of year that he had for them, and then the playoff that he's having so far for them, I'm really, really happy for him. Well, a great kid who's endured a lot. It's fun to watch, and he fills a role for them where he doesn't have to be the guy, but he sure is a nice guy to have. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, let's talk about the wild. Uh, it's been long enough, right? 50 minutes in, people are probably just freaking out. But hey, look, there's nothing to talk about. There literally has been nothing that's happened since. Um, they are still evaluating their staff. Uh, they are still, right now, um, they are having a retreat that always includes, I've talked about this for many, many years, um, since Craig Leopold has owned the team and bought it in 2008, week or two after the season, he gets GM together, their president, which is now CEO, Matt Maka, their chief financial officer and Jeff Pellegrim. Sometimes uh, the GM, in this case, Bill Guerin, will bring some members of his staff and they uh, solve the world's problem, so to speak. They go through the, what the budget is going to be next year. This will be where I assume Bill Guerin is getting, um, is checking his front office budget to see if, like the one thing that reading the tea leaves, I think he doesn't want to just have one assistant GM. I think he wants to have maybe a dual role as we've seen with other teams and with the wild in the past, when I covered Doug Riseborough, he had Tommy Thompson and Tom Lynn. One was sort of uh, assistant GM of, uh, that did, you know, contract negotiations. The other was head of scouting. And I think that he wants to do something similar here. The names that I keep on, you know, telling people are guys like Matt Sells and Chris Kelleher, I think might get promotion or he looks externally, but this would be where they decide. Matt Sells like that. has been such a valued part yep. of this organization running basically a one man show in the analytics mm -hmm. department. And I think, I think they've gained a lot of respect in his hockey knowledge. I remember Dean Evison always talking about him saying that he was one of the few analytics guys that also brought a knowledge of hockey so that he knew. He used to be a video coach. And, you know, right. So he knew for what he was looking mm -hmm. when he started digging into the numbers. Right. As opposed to just, here's a pile of numbers yeah. you guys sorted out. And I think it makes sense that he's probably the heir apparent to Chris O'Hearn just because after Chris got let go, it was Matt Sells with the help of central registry with the NHL that was doing a lot of the contract negotiations, making a lot of decisions. So I think he's definitely going to, if there, there's one, I think he's got a great chance. If there's two, I think uh, Kelleher who's uh, been here for 14 years was originally hired under by Doug Risebrow. Quincelli has been so respected his regime after regime after regime. I think that he uh, makes sense, but there's other than the world championships, nothing that's gone on so far. I mean, it, it, this is the dog days of the off season. Nothing. And nor will there be yeah. really until you get to yep. the one thing that will be interesting now is this year. So different than last, they're going to add a piece yep. at free agency and potentially more than that. If there are trades made where yep. last year we knew going into free agency, that it was going to be nothing more than depth fourth line, Iowa two way type players that were added. And this year they're, they will be a, there will be a significant decision to be made. Right. And as we talked about and argued about last week, I mean, or a couple of weeks ago now is, uh, is that they do want a top six forward, but right now the plan is to sign somebody on a one maximum two year deal. And that limits now your number of players that you're going to potentially, which brings me to my first question from Twitter, uh, you know, the type of player that you're going to go like, you know, Maybe Anthony Mantha now will sign a one-year deal after being scratched by the freaking Golden Knights. But but like, look, I mean, Tyler Topol, like Sam Reinhardt, like they're not going to be Jake Gensel. They're not signing those guys. Um, but somebody asked about Pacioretty. You know, you and I discussed David Prawn on last week's show. Somebody asked if could he be a fit on a one or two-year deal, two-year deal that fits in the cap. You know, uh, I do think they want a right shot guy though. That and Pacioretty is obviously a left. Um, this person, Dylan, writes that injury history is a downside, but would leave a spot open for Ogren Marat Ruroff if he's elevated, if he, to be elevated if he's out. Can he be a sixty-point guy? I watched him closely, coincidentally, in this Washington series. He is not the same player. He's no. had two Achilles. Um, now, to the tweeter's question, Dylan Durer is his name. If sorry, I'm mispronouncing it. One or two-year deal, he might have to sign, but. I just don't like him anymore as a player. Like no. he's not the same guy he was in Montreal or Vegas. He isn't even the same guy that he looked like for yeah. a couple of games in Carolina before yeah. his. And I, coincidentally, that second Achilles was against uh, the Wild. And if you had right, and if you had asked me at that point, I would have said yes, mm -hmm. because he can still score, but he just he doesn't move the same way anymore. And I just now don't, would he be better than Marcus Johansson? Maybe. But I actually, yeah. I would bet he ends up being a similar type yeah. spot yeah, and different player, but just you'd be getting the similar kind of production. What, what has always made Patch Reddy good is his skating. And when you have I just two Achilles, right. like how do you know? It's not the same. Who guy. knows what happens now with a full off season to. Mm -hmm. You never know. Maybe he 
rediscovers it, but he would not be the first choice for me anyway. As much as I like him as a player, and I've always been a fan of his, I just don't think at this point in his career that he's the right fit. You know what we haven't discussed? I did a Q&A the other day with Danilo Yurov. What a great kid. Um, you know, originally he was going to do a Zoom, but then he thought, you know what, let me send me the questions. I'll do it with my English teacher. And I sent him 13 questions. He, I, I told him, take your time, send it to him on the, say, a, it was a Monday morning. It was, I was, sorry, I, I, I was, it was, I can't remember the day, but it was like, say Friday night in, in Washington. And by Saturday, I had them all back. I mean, and uh, he did, uh, what a great kid. If you didn't read that, go read that in The Athletic. Um, also, I, uh, Joe Smith did an analysis on the goalie situation. Josh Svensson asked, uh, what the hell happened with the Kraken? I'm not a Dave Haxtall guy, but not sure he was deserving to be fired. Is Dean a consideration for any of the openings? Um, you know, I will say there's, you know, I was just in Carolina during the whole Rod Brindamore thing. And I got to do an exclusive story with Don Waddell, where he talked to that, you know, that day he talked to Rod about a new contract. I do think that the owner got involved and it sort of hit the brakes there. And then all of a sudden you have these, these, um, you know, rumors out there of maybe Sheldon Keefe getting fired and, and them wanting to back the Brinks truck up for, for Brindamore. And then you have the, the, the history that Brindamore's had with Ron Francis. It makes sense that this now is an urgent situation that Carolina has got to deal with. Um, I don't think that Ron Francis and Rod Brindamore, even though they were teammates in Carolina left on the greatest terms. So I don't know if that's a fit Dean Evison. I do see as a fit there. Now, Dan Bosma is the one that everybody says is going to probably get the job. He's their Coachella, their AHL coach. But Dean Evison makes a lot of sense. Teammates with Rod Brindamore, very tight to this day. Ottawa makes sense for him. With Ron Francis. Yeah. Um, Ottawa makes sense for Dean. Um, you know, so there was always the one out of all the known openings yeah. that I always thought that just seems like the right spot for a guy and like him. him. And, but I don't know. I, there are the way that things have, started to open up around the league and I think you're right if certain things happen here in these last couple of game sevens you might see even more changes I don't know about the Hackstall situation what? because I thought last year they overachieved they got their extensions though they haven't even kicked in yet the extensions I believe started next year this year they battled injuries that were right up there with the way the wild were fighting injuries and I think probably just reasonably regressed to the mean. I know there were some stories that were reported right away that, oh, this was player driven, that were players that complained in their exit interviews. Then I quickly saw players come out and say, that's not true. And I, who knows what the real story is behind the scenes. It surprised me because it certainly seemed like they were an organization headed the right direction. It seems like a strange left turn. Yeah, but. A lot of injuries this year. I did think he was in trouble all year though. And I, I remember sitting with Dean after he got fired and we we're talking about potential places you can go. And I'm like, what about Seattle? And he's like, I think hack is in trouble. I'm like, I'm just saying, yeah. you know, possible. And this was back in December. Well, that, those were the people were talking about that during the season. And I was like, look, they just signed the guy to an extension. Yeah. And this year, anybody would have looked at that team and said the odds of them making the second round of the playoffs again yeah. are slim to none. Yeah. That Sometimes was, extensions mean nothing depending on who the owner is. Like Jerry well, Bruckheimer and Sam. Yeah. I agree. It's like the same thing. Like Toronto, right. I don't care that Sheldon Keefe just got an ascension. Yeah. If they lose it's their like, easy, it could yeah, be in trouble. It's different. But I, I think when you're, to me in Seattle, what it said was less about that we've got an unbelievably deep pocketbook and it doesn't matter. It was that. They liked what he did. We, yeah. We believe in where we're headed as a team. And I don't think it was fair to judge a guy mm -hmm. based on what happened last year for them. Mm -hmm. I thought they were playing really good hockey late in the season. They just yeah. didn't have enough firepower. Yep. So that would lead you to believe that maybe some of these stories that were released were true, that players really yeah. didn't like them. But I don't know. It, there, do you really look at that roster and say the core of this group is the no. group that's going to be here going forward anyway? No. So it, it seems strange to me. I think we'll probably hear more about it in the months and years to yeah. come. Wild Boy is 59 and goes, if there was one underrated center in the league you could trade for, who would it be? Like example, Seth Jarvis is my opinion, uh, in my opinion, is underrated. The only thing I'll say is Seth Jarvis actually doesn't play center uh, for Carolina, but I would agree with you. He is going to be a, he's a good freaking player. stud. Like Jake Gensel, I couldn't get him to stop talking about how good this guy is going to be. Um, I love Jarvis's love his game, but he's technically not a center. You know, I will say I was just in Florida. Anton Lundell has become a heck of a player. He is a key cog to that team. 
Um, uh, but if you had to think of one underrated center, I mean, obviously, like the Wild aren't going to be able to trade for this guy. But every time I watch Rupe Hints, that guy is a stud. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if he's underrated anymore, yeah. but I, I'm a huge Hints fan. I have been all along. I, I just, I think he's a, he's a game changer. That was when we were getting ready for the playoff series last year. I remember looking at it saying, everybody's talking about Robertson and mm-hmm. comparing Robertson to Kaprizov. Hintz was the guy you had to try to figure out yeah. a way to stop. Let's get rowdy. I don't know if you're trying to just get me going here, because if you listen to this podcast on a regular basis, you will know how for years I have do not like Pierre-Luc Dubois. But uh, he asked if the numbers worked, who would you rather have on the Minnesota roster, Pierre-Luc Dubois or Marco Rossi? Marco Rossi, any day of the freaking week. They're Pierre already Luke talking Dubois about is, buying out Pierre-Luc he Dubois. No, he is he just signed an eight-year deal in LA, oh, and they're already God, saying, is it a contract I have, that the Kings you know, would consider and let buying the record out? show, even when Dubois was great last year in Winnipeg, I have long said that, said that he the, is a nothing It was runner. one of the best trades yeah. Winnipeg ever made yeah. to move him. The fact that the, the deal was, that he's been traded already from Columbus mm-hmm. to Winnipeg, and then it, this guy, it isn't going to work. Yeah. And there's... I wouldn't trade anybody on the wild roster yep. for him uh, with Doug his Lindgren contract. Doug Lindgren asks, uh, what's going to be our drink of choice in Portugal when we go this offseason? Well, Doug's been a regular on our trips. And I will say, I went to a bar in Northeast Minneapolis maybe a month or two ago, actually with another couple, the Skogsteads, who were on our trip two years ago mm-hmm. and are going to be back this year. And they had a Portuguese wine on the menu. So I ordered it because I said, I got to start doing my research right now. What do you think? It was good. It was yeah. actually really good. It had a little bit of like a Tempranillo kind of taste to it. So there's a lot more research that still has to be done. Does it have a Tignanello? I'm mispronouncing Tignanello. it. Tignanello. I love that wine. Yeah, that's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, but it's, it's not quite that. No, Tempranillo is more of a, it's got a little, I would say, a spice almost mm-hmm. flavor to it. The typical Tempranillos do, a Spanish red. I, the Portuguese wine was that, but I've got a long way to go. I will be doing my research before we go just so that you make sure you know what you're trying to make sure you don't miss while we're there. I'm so excited about that yep. trip. A couple quick hitters and then a fun last question. Uh, TJC, any concerns about Felino's ability to stay on the ice? He hasn't played a, f- a full season as many years. I mean, you could say the same thing about Spurge. I think there's always concerns. Yeah. And I think right now there's reason for optimism for both of them. They both, mm-hmm. they both seem to be healthy. They both are coming off of surgeries that in the past have not limited a guy's future career in any way. But I always think when you get to this point in your career and with Spurgeon, you're talking about a guy who relies on his skating. He is undersized, plays a lot of minutes. You have to, in the back of your mind, wonder, is this a sign of things to come? I I'm not saying in any way that it's guaranteed to be that, but I think it's human nature to wonder. And the same with Felino, he plays such a, hard, heavy, hard working kind of game that I, and even though the, the injuries might be unrelated, might be freak kind of things there, there is a part of you that says, how long can you play those kind of minutes and not expect the body to start to break down? I think both of them are incredibly hard working guys that do everything they can to make sure their bodies are ready, but the NHL world is a grind. So I think if those two guys can stay healthy, this team is right back to where they were a couple of years ago, where you're talking about a team around a hundred points and uh, because they are so important to what else happens around the roster. If those two guys can keep themselves on the ice for say 75 games next year. K fan girl goes, it seems like Logan Stanley has fallen out of favor in Winnipeg. I don't know if he was ever in favor. Actually, that's me talking. Um, I don't know his contract status, and I know he's not great, but is he? But he's huge, and would be the worth. Well, it's while interesting. The most important thing he on. did was fall when he fell on Caprice. Yeah, like that. That's the one thing, K fan girl is like. If they, I agree with you that they got to get bigger, but it's got to be the right guy. You don't. I mean, who cares if if somebody's big if he sucks? And Logan Stanley sucks. I mean, it's, that guy could take a penalty every second he's on the ice. I was watching one shift where he actually did get called a penalty in the in that. Colorado series where he honestly took three, four penalties on the shift. He's just a wor- he's yeah. terrible. He's and he's that kind of player. Yeah. He always has been, yeah. always will be. He's not a. I fed. think Phil wants this pod to end. Um, let's see. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Fort Crunch asks, any chance the Wild get Fiala back? No. Um, 
Fort Crunch also asked, what's been our favorite destination for our summer tours? So we've done Sicily, we've done Tuscany, which included uh, Lake Como, which was amazing, Venice and Florence. Cinque Terre. Uh, and um, and uh, that's probably my favorite right now. But I loved when we went, when we did Munich, Lucerne, and I think it was Innsbruck and Salzburg. And then we did uh, Budapest, Budapest, Prague, yeah. and Vienna. I mean, Tuscan, me, the Italy, the, the first Italy trip was probably my favorite. I loved Lake Como. Um, I, I think I would take. Where's the oh, bark collar? Yeah. Do, uh, can't you zap them? Well, this is, uh, I think the neighbors just walked by and they've got Michael Waters dog next door. Uh, this dog that's about 14 times the size of Stanley and Phil uh -huh. combined. And he really gets under their skin quickly. Um, I think my favorite was Sicily, and I've always wanted to go. That I, was a great. Thing. I loved the scenery, and everything was so good. And the food I thought was the best of any of the trips we've taken so far. The and talking to people from there, I was I didn't really understand it, but apparently it's the most fertile soil in the world, and it's because three different continental plates all meet there, and so there's a there's a little bit of a bunch of different parts of the world and for that reason like their citrus was the best their everything they made there, the olives the nuts the tomatoes yeah. the lemons they were all as good as anything i've ever tasted so for me i'll put sicily number one but northern italy was special too yep uh lucas asked uh, how long after july one would you expect the favor extension to be announced i'd say about 9 a.m 10 a.m probably um ryan bailey is there any chance jake Gensel wants to sign in minnesota uh, yeah, if he'll take $1.8 million a year or something, uh, Wild can't afford him. Um, there's a reason why Pittsburgh didn't sign him at the beginning. And they have a certain number and they want to be fair, but it's a high number. Um, let's see. Uh, Hockey Balboa goes, uh, love your work. I'd love to hear some insight on the Minnesota Wild players feel having such a massive cap deficit year after year, effectively hamstrung in them. How do they feel? Does it hurt their motivation? You know, it's funny because Bill Guerin always says the players don't care about this. That's not true. They mention it to me. Um, they know they're, they know that they're, I mean, and it's, it, Anthony, human nature has got to know that deep down that they're not on a level playing field when they're going up against Vegas and Dallas and all these, you know? Yeah. I think, I think you split the roster in half because the top half guys and the top end guys, I'm sure are thinking that in the back of their mind mm -hmm. that, boy, I'd like to have, $14 million worth of players on our third line. If you talk to the third and fourth line guys who are in the NHL because they don't have that, <laughs> I don't think they're going to tell you that they wish they had $14 million <laughs> more to spend. That's a great point. Uh, all right, three more quick ones. Uh, Kevin Th Thorson goes, would love to see Boldy transition to center. He's got the height and frame where he could fill out and be a future number one center. When he does get pulled in to draw his success, uh, been saying that for years, your thoughts. I don't know why you want to mess with that. I mean, no, he, he wasn't a, good at he's center a shooter, in college. He's a shooter, not a playmaker. Yeah, and like he's one of the best young players they've ever had and prolific. Why do you want to mess with him right now? I don't agree. I mean, people say the same thing. Like, how come they don't move Rossi to win? Let's just play where they are supposed to play. Uh, Logan Nation, I mean, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with your premise that he would has that ability, but I don't know why you want to mess with that guy right now. Um, plus, they got Yurov coming and, and, um, and Riley Hyatt and these guys that could be centers. Um, Logan nation asks, uh, when a player hasn't modified, no trade, say 10 teams, do you know, or are able to find out which 10 teams are, uh, usually that is totally a secret. And remember it changes all the time. It, it could change it I annually. They had talked about um, the fact that they were going to have the league help with that. They, for they were future talking about years. that they, from now on, that maybe you would have to at least turn it into central registry. So they know, and right. that, and that has been kiboshed. So it's only the GM that knows. Sometimes as a reporter, you find out like, you know, when right. a guy no, does like Alex about, Goligoski, right. I've reported yeah. had a chance a couple times to go to the Islanders and chose not to. Right. Um, but that's but I stuff thought that they you, had talked yeah. about the fact that because there were a couple deals made where they didn't realize that a guy had submitted yeah, his it list. The, on it was time the Vegas and, Ottawa deal. With, right. uh, was it dad enough? It, or, was, yeah. it was dad enough. Yeah. And it was. So I thought at that point there was talk about the league saying from now on, we're going to require that to be here so that we can catch right. it when the trade's made. But that, that hasn't they, happened. And either way to it, it, it would not, he's saying, you know, would the two reporters find out? And that is not the case. Last question. Uh, Russo goes, uh, or a uh, corn dog goes, what Russo, when you're in a cigar, cigar lounge, what is your drink of choice? Lapanta, have you found any staples from the drink? 
of the month club for me. Um, first of all, uh, I haven't had a drink in months, uh, just because I've been on, a, on, on Olivia weight control. Um, so, and not that you can't drink on that, but I've chosen not to, because it just obviously slows everything down. So I haven't had since Christmas. Um, but when I am in a cigar lounge, a lot of times I'll have wine or a glass of whiskey or just a vodka soda. Uh, the one thing I do now, like I, there, I found one in Florida that I go is I just order a big bottle of San Pellegrino and drink some, uh, some carbonated water, uh, there, but have you found any staples? Um, we've had a few and I don't visit a lot of the cigar bars, but when I do, I'm either a red wine or bourbon. He's asking about your drink of the month. No, I know. I was just following up on the cigar bars because to me, I love a cigar with either red wine or bourbon when I have my two cigars a year. But the, in for our cocktail of the month club, we've got a couple that we've stuck with. And the one I'd say that's the most prevalent is a tequila drink that has lime juice, chocolate bitters, a little bit of syrup. And then after you mix that well, you top it off with a sparkling pink grapefruit, add a lime wedge. It is dynamite. And those go down way too fast on the patio in the summer. I'd say that's the one that has stuck with us more than any others, but there have been a lot that have been really good that have at least led us down the path of, we could try this, but we prefer blackberry to this or something. And and even well, I just can tell you right now, if you made me that drink, I would need something besides the grapefruit. I cannot stand grapefruit. Yeah, you'd be surprised. It doesn't have a lot of it. The grapefruit taste is subtle, uh-huh. but it's a perfect mix with chocolate bitters, which I would have never thought of in a million years. It is. It's really good, and it's a great little sipping drink. The but I think what's been interesting about it that I've learned a lot is just different techniques of mixing the drinks. Where now you okay. This is how you do it. We could try it with, and a lot of them have like herb syrup where, well, we could make a syrup that's got basil and lime in it and, and try that with this. Mm -hmm. And so it it has, it's been a really, it was one of the better gifts my kids have ever given me. Wow. Um, Well, uh, fun podcast. Uh, Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. I know uh, we didn't talk a ton about the wild, but there really is not a lot to talk about. Um, I have a flight in exactly three hours, so I better get home and send this podcast, uh, to our incredible producer, Brandon. Uh, I normally would do that here, but Anthony's got dial up modem, uh, fi at this house. It's that speed of it. Um, I did figure out this is my 10th flight in the last 11 days. Which is crazy. Um, and I'm not even, con- uh, including the, um, the, the connection. Um, so uh, thanks for everybody for joining. Uh, we'll be back again next week and the following week and the following week. Uh, there'll be remote shows like this one. Thanks for joining us at the Aquarius Home Services studio. Thanks to Fellers Ranch, our newest sponsor, Bosch Law Firm, Livia Weight Control Centers, Will and the Dyna Galleria, Aquarius Home Services, your local authorized dealer for medical water treatment systems, and Royal Credit Union. Talk to you next week. So much coming out, there's nothing going in. I know that you feel like you're never gonna win. All oh, but the world won't forgive a winner. Apparently you have to be a journalist to know when a Dallas star is diving.